Hi. So today's lecture will involve mostly discussions that seem to be highly mathematical, and、uh, pertains rather little to the actual physics of electrostatics. But that's also, I think, the nature of this graduate level lecture, because a large portion of what goes on in electrostatics and、uh, Electrodynamics textbook is actually about mathematical physics, and、uh, this book is is no really no exception in that regard. So I'm going to、um, develop a a couple of ideas that seem pretty mathematical, but in the long run they also turn out to have a fair amount of、uh, physical implications. So.、Uh, Here I'm going to discuss a、uh, a way to look at the potential、uh, for first of all the case where you have a single point charge, where we all know the answer very well. It's just one inverse、uh, of the distance from the origin, assuming that the charge, a point charge of charge Q is located at the origin and the potential falls off as inverse of the distance from it, and and by invoking the superposition principle, then the whole collection of charges will give rise to the potential that is nothing but a sum of those potentials from arising from individual charges, and when you when you pass this expression. Of sum to the continuum,、uh, assuming there's a continuous distribution of charges, then you arrive at this well-known integral form for the、uh, potential. Okay, so this is、uh, this is something we already know very well, and we have covered this probably several times already.、Um, so now let me move on to a slightly less trivial and.、Uh, Presumably less familiar discussion, and the and the situation involves a single rod which has a charge density of lambda per unit length and has an infinite extent. So you can think of it as a infinitely thin cylinder of infinite length, and the cylinder is coated with、um, a linear charge of Lambda per unit length along the entire length of its existence, and we have just shown in the last lecture that the electric field that comes out from it is is falling off as the inverse distance from the、uh, cylinder and proportional to the linear charge density in this manner. So from this electrostatic field strength, you can deduce the form of the electrostatic potential as the logarithm of the distance, and you can see this simply by the fact that if you take the、uh, derivative of this potential, then log becomes one over rho, and therefore you get to recover this nice electrostatic、uh, field function. And rho,、uh, in in a simpler language, is nothing but、uh, x squared plus y squared with a square root sign covering it. But since you're in the inside the logarithm, that square root can be moved as a factor one half in front. So this is it. This is the、uh, this is the mathematical expression for the potential that arises due to a infinitely long. Cylinder of charge density lambda. And now imagine a situation where you have a whole collection of such infinitely long cylinders or rods, and the overall potential is again by invoking the superposition principle will be just this sum.、Uh, so now let's assume that、uh, each rod is located at the coordinates x i and y i. So they individually give rise to a potential, which is given by this sort of logarithmic function, multiplied by their relative weight, which is the their respective charge density 
um, calling it lambda i. And likewise, you can pass to the continuum limit, in which case this sum becomes some kind of an integral form like that. Okay, so here's a more graphical uh, description of the situation I have in mind. That is, if you have, uh, suppose you're, li you're living in a world where every charge comes in the form of this, of such infinitely long cylinders. And they get to move around, and, and because it has an infinite extent in, in this uh, third direction, which I call the Z direction, their existence is intrinsically uh, two-dimensional. What I mean by that is that they can only move around really in this uh, two-dimensional XY plane. And so they behave like some uh, particle that are confined in the two-dimensional plane and not allowed to move outside of it. And they interact with each other as two charges would interact with each other in three dimensions. But the key difference is that the interaction energy between two uh, so-called charges in this two-dimensional space is not, uh, is not the usual Coulomb form. And the Coulomb potential would fall off as one over the distance between the two charges. But here, the uh, interaction energy depends on their separation as a log. So you have uh, uh, basically a charge of lambda 1 from one rod and charge of lambda 2 from another rod, and they're separated by a distance r12. And their interaction energy is, is given by the product of their respective charges multiplied by the logarithm of their separation. So this is in, in contrast to the interaction potential between two point charges that live in a three-dimensional world and you may think this is a this is a kind of artificial situation because you can never have such infinitely long objects in in the real world but um, if you know something about condensed matter systems for example if you have vortices uh, which are topological objects uh, um, and they, they very well exist in two-dimensional space, the interaction potential between two vortices is, happens to be exactly given by such a log potential. So, so this sort of interaction energy is not as unusual as it might seem because there are objects that does occur in nature that does have such a logarithmic interaction potential between them. Okay, and the third example is that of uh, infinitely large but infinitely thin slab of uniform charges. So this is uh, this is a piece of uh, metallic. Uh, this is a piece of charged uh, object which has infinite extent but uh, infinitesimal thickness, and it's uniformly coated with uh, charge density uh, sigma. And the electric field coming out of it is, is pointing, obviously, away from the plane in the direction normal to the plane. And uh, its strength is given by the charge density divided by twice the, uh, the electric constant. That's the result we derived in the previous lecture by invoking Gauss' law and a bit of a symmetry principle. And um, so depending on which side of the plane you're in, the electric field is uh, either pointing in the plus z direction or uh, pointing in the minus z direction. So a formula that captures both, both of these situations is will go something like this. And, uh, and the potential that corresponds to such an electrostatic field is, is that. So interesting thing here is that the potential grows linearly with the separation. Okay, so, uh, so if, 
Now, if you have a collection of such charge plates, so the situation is described in this schematic figure. You have one infinite plane with charge uh, density sigma 1 on it, another infinite plane with charge density sigma 2 on it, another with a sigma charge density sigma 3 on it, and so on. And they're separated from uh, each other by a certain distance. And you ask, what is the interaction energy between them? And the answer is, uh, is this. It's, uh, it's the potential, uh, I should say, uh, the potential. I should mention the potential first. So the potential generated by a collection of such charged plates is the sum of the potential generated by the individual plate. So this is simply a superposition of the formulas that we got earlier here um, for the individual plate with a charge density sigma i. And passing to the uh, continuum limit would give rise to a formula that, that would look like this. And, and furthermore, if you have a pair of such charged plates, then their interaction energy would either increase or decrease with their relative separation, uh, depending on whether you have a pair of equally charged plates or plates with opposite signs of charges. So if you have oppositely charged plates, then um, their interaction energy, their potential energy, will grow linearly with a distance, which basically means that it's impossible to separate the two plates out to an infinite separation, because doing so would require an infinite amount of energy, and, and, and that's, that's impossible. Okay, So if you have heard about uh, asymptotic freedom and so on, like quarks cannot be separated out to an infinite distance, here already in, in classical physics, we have an example of such a confining potential. Uh, by confining potential, I mean the potential whose nature is such that it's impossible to separate the two objects completely because doing so would require uh, spending an infinite amount of energy, which is not possible. Okay, so... Now, let me move to uh, the next theme, which is uh, a discussion, uh, a rather mathematical discussion of the solid angle. Um, and this has close connection to the Gauss law. Uh, but, um, yeah, so here what I am going to do is, is kind of a review of how the proof of the Gauss law came about, but at the same time, I'm going to emphasize the perspective, which is more geometric and pertains to the uh, solid angle uh, view. And so here we go. So first of all, uh, if you surround this uh, point, and I'm going to define this point as the origin. So its coordinate is uh, 0, 0, 0. Uh, and I'm going to surround it with, uh, with a sphere whose radius is r. And I'm going to perform an integral on the surface of this uh, sphere. And the content of the integral is the following. I take uh, an area element of that uh, spherical surface, so it's a small patch. It's a small patch of that uh, spherical surface. Uh, and I take an inner product of that uh, area element vector with the, with the vector that indicates the location of that patch on the sphere. That's the R vector. And uh, uh, as you know very well, this inner product equals R cubed times the familiar expression uh, giving rise to the um, area element on the sphere, that's sine theta times d theta d phi, 
but the integral is also dividing uh, involves dividing by r cube so this r cube factor gets cancelled out and all you have left is just the integral of uh, sine theta over both the angle theta and and the angle phi which gives uh, 4 pi as you know very well and this is nothing but the surface area of the unit sphere so um, let's let's take a step back and, and ask how did we end up calculating the surface area of the unit sphere even though we set out to do the integral on a sphere that has a radius r not not radius equal to one and the answer comes about in in roughly two steps um, so the first step in that path to understanding is that this uh, inner product really signifies a projection so here's what i mean by the projection so here's my uh, r vector and this little vector is the unit vector that points in the same direction as the r vector which is the position vector and now i give you some random uh, surface area uh, a random patch of surface which i indicated as a small uh, square and this a small square has a corresponding area element vector which i denote as ds and that's a wiggly line uh, indicates that this is really a vector area element but what i obtain by taking a projection by taking an inner product of these two uh, vectorial objects is that i'm basically rotating this plane or rather projecting this uh, small patch of surface to be perpendicular to the uh, r vector okay so i've tried to indicate that this uh, this new plane which is the projected plane has um, r vector as its uh, as its orthogonal component okay so what i obtain from taking the inner product of these two uh, vectors is not the area of the original patch of surface i started with but the area of the projected patch okay so you're basically what you're doing is you're basically rotating this uh, orientation of the small patch to be exactly orthogonal to the to the r vector okay so that's the step one and the step two is dividing by r square and what the divi division by r square accomplishes is, is is basically to just scale the area uh, to that as seen by at, at the unit distance so if you watch some objects to have the area of one meter square but that object happens to be uh, two meters away from you but if you were to project that area to uh, a different but equal equally looking object at a one meter separation then the area would be reduced by uh, one quarter uh, to one quarter because area scales as the distance scare squared okay so that's what the division by r square basically accomplishes so so if this is the area uh, this is the actual area and this uh, this patch of surface happens to be at a distance r from the origin then it will present itself as having the same area as uh, as the similar patch but with an area reduced by r square okay if this patch is uh, is smoothly brought back to the brought back to have the separation uh, equal to one rather than equal to r. Okay, so in conclusion, what this uh, piece of expression really pertains is 
the following as I try to depict by a simple graph. So this is the original um, surface, okay? But what you really want to measure is the projected area, not the area of the original surface. So the projection occurs by uh, following a array which emanates from the uh, origin. And this, from this origin, there's a straight line that reaches a particular point on the surface that you originally had in mind. And that ray will cross the unisphere at some point. So as that ray traces out the entire area of the surface, uh, the projected ray on the unisphere will trace out a, a, a much smaller patch of surface. And what this thing measures is basically the area of this projected surface. Okay. So obviously, if you cover this entire unit sphere, what you measure is nothing but the area of the unit sphere, which is well known to be uh, 4 pi. Okay, so now let's generalize a little bit. And suppose you move your observation point away from the origin and uh, place it at, uh, at the position Rs. So you keep the same unit sphere, but now you move yourself away from the origin, which was the nice symmetric center of the unit sphere, to some obscure place uh, denoted by the position vector Rs. And then you do all your projection from this vantage point. Okay. So now the projected area element is given uh, by a slightly different integral because the, the relevant vector will now be uh, r minus rs, not r itself. r is the position vector as measured from the old origin, but you're not measuring the location on the surface from that vantage point, you're measuring it from rs. So the vector you our measuring is, is really R minus Rs, and that's the expression you have to use here. Okay, so your um, surface area um, element will be given by this formula now. And this uh, ray that will define the projected surface will be emanating not from the origin, but from Rs which means that the, uh, this small patch of area on the original surface will have a different projected area because now the projection is done, from, uh, is, is done towards a different point. Okay, so this individual piece of area element, dA, changes uh, depending on what you choose for Rs. However, if you do the uh, do do this projection over the entire uh, surface of the unit sphere. At the end of the day, what you will end up measuring is again just the total surface area of the unit sphere, which does not change, and uh, you still obtain four pi as the answer. So this is a way to intuitively understand. Uh, why such an integral would always give you the same answer for pi, regardless of where you put the, this observation point Rs, as long as the observation point remains inside the, inside the surface enclosed by, uh, by the S. Okay. So this piece of math is what underlies the Gauss theorem, uh, which is a theorem that says that as long as your imaginary Gaussian surface encloses 
the charge, then it doesn't matter where that charge is located. The charge will always contribute the fixed amount to the Gaussian integral. And therefore, the integral will just count how many charges there are inside that bag of Gaussian surface. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Thank you.